What's going on, everybody? My name, of course, is Chad. It is so good to see you. I missed you. This week, we're going to finish up uh, a friend and fan of the channel, Henry's submission. He gave us a series of classical Japanese. This week is classical Japanese reader as well as essential dictionary. I'm really excited to share this with you guys. I think you're gonna enjoy it because I enjoyed it. And if you're subbed to me and you're watching me, you probably like what I like. So let's take a second, <sighs> breathe out, and let's hop over to the hands-on table and let's see what we're working with. Hey, what's going on everybody? Welcome back to the hands-on reviewing table. This week we have book number two, as I mentioned in the intro, classical Japanese reader and essential dictionary. This book is of equal cost, basically, with the main book that we reviewed last week, classical Japanese, a grammar, uh, is it worth it? Is it something that you should have on your shelves? I'm really torn about this because I love the book and I'll show you guys inside of it here in just a second, but the price. Ouchie. This book right now, brand new on Amazon, which is where you should purchase it if you guys like this material. I always recommend in all of my reviews, if any of you guys like what you see, please, please, please go support the author. They work tirelessly, usually with teams to make these resources for us. So go support legitimate authors. Uh, for this guy, we're looking at a $65 price range, uh, which is a lot, especially for essentially a practice book. Think of this almost like the workbook to a grammar's uh, textbook, I guess. Now, it's not a perfect comparison, but let's look at what we get for that type of money. This Japanese reader comes to a total of 278 pages. They are separated into six major parts, as well as a dictionary over 17 chapters uh, and it costs, again, about $65. Again, along with the other book, uh, just a quick warning, maybe you're specifically looking at this book, you didn't check out my other view, I will very quickly go over the fact that the furigana you see over all of the historic kanjis uh, are not pronounced the way that we pronounce them. You can see here, this is Osaka, Osaka. And so one of the reasons I point this out is you have the traditional writing, the traditional kanji, I should say, you have the traditional historic reading of the kana above it, uh, but if you read that, it says Ahusaka, which is actually showing right here, Ahusaka, rather than the more modern romanization of Osaka. So just something to be aware of, I would not put in, uh, unless you're trying to learn the historic kana, the furigana above any of the kanjis in this book, uh, those are historic kana readings. Always add the romanized versions. The romanized versions inside this textbook are the uh, more modern way that we would pronounce that word. Furthermore, before I go any farther, uh, this book gives you an exhaustive list of all the grammatical abbreviations, and boy, are these pretty important to know inside of here. Uh, most of these, like verb, adverb, noun, uh, you probably know most of these, e-adjectives, no-adjectives, whatever you want to call those. Um, a lot of these you probably don't know, and it will come very in handy to probably backfill uh, what you don't know into your Anki decks, into your memorized decks, and you'll see why in a second. But I'm just warning you up front that that's actually going to be very, very helpful later on. So one of the very cool things about this book is it is separated into a bunch of different parts that use complete texts. Uh, so unlike the A Grammar, the book that we reviewed last week in this series, where it's essentially one sentence, one piece from some actual Japanese literature from that period, and then they show through that one sentence how the grammar works, this one's a little bit different. It takes the reverse approach. It shows you the entire context and then annotates how all that is to work. So real quickly, let's take a look at the, the setup here. Every part starts with essentially an introduction. It introduces you to who wrote uh, what the section we're about to read is. This is an account of a 10-foot square hut. At least that's the English name of it. It tells you who wrote it, a bit about them, uh, what the actual text means within history. And then one page over, I'm sure most of you guys just lost your lunch, uh, especially if you're a newer Japanese reader. This looks intense. Uh, and it's not just this. You can see up here in the corners, there's a one, a two, a three, a four. So luckily, the book actually subsects out the real, like this is the actual text. Uh, this is not uh, simplified. This is not excerpts. This is the text. And you can see it goes on uh, for quite a long time. Seven sections in this case. Uh, and luckily, although if you guys are wondering, hey, maybe this book's for me. They start with the easiest texts first, or at least the ones that are most like 
uh, the, the modern Japanese, the most like what people will understand, the easiest grammar to grasp. All of this book is set up so the easiest is first. So this is the easiest. This is the entry level. Congratulations. Uh, and let's move on to, okay, so now that you've thoroughly panicked, like I did when I first saw it, although as I've been using it, it's, it definitely subsided the panic. Uh, you actually get something that is super duper helpful and something I actually really enjoy. So it's set up per section. So this is vocab for section one. So it's not for all of this. You're not getting every single section, section six, section five. Right here, we're just focusing on section one. And you can see the, uh, the vocabulary in here. A lot of this, by the way, is still used in today's Japanese. So if you've learned, you know, narabu, same thing, right? Congratulations. Actually, really nice. A lot of these readers don't have this. So I, I like having a, a complete vocabulary guide. That is all the vocab used in all of the sentences in part one. Now, this is the part that originally was a little bit difficult for me because I never took the time to learn grammatical terms for Japanese. You know, I learned what things were not necessarily what they were called. So it's being like, I know what a noun is and I know how to use a noun, but I didn't know it was called noun. So that's sort of the thing. Uh, down here, you could see here's a grammatical section. They break down exactly why the grammatical section means what it actually means. And if you can look at a lot of these, it is a lot of kind of random uh, grammar to be annotated. Uh, and if you come down here, it actually uses every single one of those grammatical terms. Hopefully you guys can see that. So you can see on top of each and every one of these, they actually have, whether it's a noun, a verb, an adjective, an interjection. And that's why when I told you at the beginning of this video, it was worth it to memorize all of these things. It's because they don't give you the English uh, grammatical term. They give you the one in Japanese, which is fine. Like if you're at a level where you can read this, that's fine. I'm just letting you guys know you probably should actually learn what all of those grammatical structures are. They also break it down into each, as you can see on the underline, each grammatical structure underneath what the thing is. And it goes all the way through part one and then it starts over for section two. So you go back and read section two. Uh, whatever you struggled with, you backfill with this information, at least in terms of vocabulary. You have your grammar explanations and notes. Mind you, the grammar is explained more in depth in the a grammar, the first book. Uh, this is more of a, a second book in the series, so they're not gonna go as in depth. This is an overview of an explanation. And then of course it completely annotated so you can see how it's supposed to work. Now, it's not just major like crazy long pieces and chunks like that. Uh, it also contains really great poems. As you can see, this is from the Kamakura period. This is the 100 poets, 100 poems. Uh, and you can see these are very short, section one, two, three, four, five, six. It gives you who the author is and what the actual thing says over here. And then of course you come back over here, the vocabulary is a lot shorter because there's frankly very little words in here. Uh, pretty short grammar section for anything that might be new, annotated, so that way you guys know exactly how to write it. This one's even cool, it gives you a modern Japanese equivalent. The reason they give the modern Japanese equivalent is because uh, it's hard. It's kind of like reading uh, Shakespeare and then you can have like what Shakespeare actually wrote and then kind of what that means in modern English because in modern parlance it's not always the same. This was actually very nice to see. I wasn't expecting this and it, it makes me very happy that that's there because this is significantly easier to read for me and it helps me kind of put into context what's on top. Now, coming to the back of the book, we have one of the things that I find very, very worthwhile about this book. This is the essential dictionary for this book. And mind you, I have several archaic dictionaries on my shelf right now, but in the same way that it's not very, it's not the most efficient way to learn any language is just grab a dictionary and start at A and memorize until you get to Z. There's a frequency of words. Um, there are ones that are used a lot. There's ones that might be used only in one obscure document. And all of those are in the archaic Japanese dictionaries. This, however, are very, very common. These are all the ones not only just used in this book, but she has a bunch that are used all over the place that aren't in this book. They're just so common that they're worth knowing. On top of that, she organized these basically into two categories. You have the lowercase words. You could see the romanized words here. They're in lowercase. And those are just regular. Sometimes they're used a lot. Sometimes they're not used very much. But they have ones that are in uh, these caps, basically all caps. Those are very frequently used. So if anything, if you're going to prioritize what you should learn, you want to prioritize the capital letter ones before you do the other ones. And that'll give you more frequency, more of the ones you're going to see all the time. And I really appreciate that. You don't normally see frequency 
uh, super explained. You basically go, oh, all of these to some extent or another are very frequent, but there are some that are super frequent, ones that are used a lot more than other people. And that's why having that is actually really, really nice. And as you can see, it is hundreds, hundreds of words. I'm not gonna show you all of it because I want you to go out and purchase this book yourself if you would like. Now, I told you in the beginning, I am a little bit conflicted because first off, the book is beautifully bound. It is just an absolutely lovely volume to have on a shelf. It looks great. Uh, I love the gold flaking on all of this. This is actual gold flake on it. Um, I love what it teaches. I love what I get to practice with this book, as well as the a grammar, the original. But this is $65 for just this. It's essentially a workbook with a few, probably a thousand words or less dictionary. That's a, that's a tough price, but given if you finish a grammar, which is also about $60, and this, you're spending about $120 to be proficient uh, in your continued quest in classical Japanese. It is not everything you need to know, but it is sort of like when you hit that point just in, in modern Japanese, where you can go out and use native resources to continue learning. You don't need textbooks. You don't necessarily have to take a class. You can just dive into the real language. And, and for $120, that's about what you would spend on both Genki books and the workbooks. So I think if you put it into that lens, that this is hyper, hyper, worth it. And before I close up, there actually technically is a 0.5, maybe a, you could call it a third book, but I call it a 0.5. This goes with the classical Japanese grammar. I didn't review it before because I thought the video was going long. Essentially, it's just answers to the exercises they have in the original textbook. Uh, if you're planning on using this, uh, a grammar at least, not just as a, a reference or maybe some extra practice because you already took classical Japanese, but you want to actually learn classical Japanese from it so you're utilizing the uh, exercises that they had, this is totally worth it. The charts really, I don't think are that worth it. You can get these in any archaic Japanese dictionary. All of these charts are inside the actual grammar textbook. So I don't consider the tables and charts all that worthwhile, unless you're, maybe you're teaching classical Japanese, but frankly, that's above my head because I'm learning classical Japanese right now. So if you're gonna learn a grammar as a textbook, definitely just grab this. It's only a few extra more dollars. Otherwise, the original grammar and this as far as I'm concerned, it's worth it, but man, trying to convince myself to pay $125, or about $120 on Amazon, rough, uh, but doable. I do think I would spend that money now having seen these, but before, I'm not entirely sure. But that's just my thoughts. What do you guys think? What do you think of this whole series, this being the final video on it? Let me know in the comments down below, and we will finish this up with studi Studio Chad. All right, everybody, that was a classical Japanese reader and Essential Dictionary. You guys saw it as well as I did, so tell me, what do you think? Give me your honest thoughts. Is it worth it? Is that $65 price tag starting to push it for you guys, or is that very justifiable for what you saw in the book? Let me know in the comments down below. I personally read all of them, and if you like this video, please maybe consider liking it down below. It helps my channel tremendously. It tells the YouTube algorithm, hey, I'm interacting with this content, please share it with other people. And that's how, frankly, I've grown this channel forever. I don't chase trends, otherwise I would not be reviewing textbooks. Uh, I like helping people. So if you want to support me for free, that is the best way to do it, as well as subscribe. I put out a video like this every single Wednesday. I also author my own books, so you can go to my Amazon links down below, check out everything I do. I import uh, fly rods from Japan. I have a Discord called Anime Night that has 400 plus, almost 500 now, other Japanese learners that are there just to encourage each other to talk to me, maybe consider joining that community. At That's My Chat on Twitter, Chad Zimmerman, probably on most everything else. If you are unsubscribed, that's okay. But if you're subscribed and it is free to do so, there is a subscriber only outro at the end of this video where I do something cool and unique, but it's only for subs. So if you're not interested, don't, don't worry about it. You can have a blessed day. So for the unsubscribed, love hard, love deep, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye. Hey, thank you for staying after. I really appreciate it. Uh, I got some cool news. Yeah, nope, Japan's still closed. That would have been sweet, wouldn't it have been? No, but the motherland is open, and that, heavily redacted, is uh, the Russian visa that I got issued this week. It finally came in the mail. Boy, don't I look scared. So yes, I am going to Russia in uh, December, the very, very end of December. I'll be there till the end of January, which is, ba by the way, when I take a break anyways from YouTube, so it really won't bother you guys too much. 
you might encounter two videos that uh, happen while I'm over there. But uh, yeah, it's gonna be fun. Just wanted to share that with you guys. I thought that that was really cool. And uh, if you're in Japan planning on going or living in Japan, just so you know, there are some countries that are kind of right next to Japan. I don't know why I have to explain that. Uh, and I have lots of series on travel about these places that are really close. I have them in China, in Korea. I'll be adding them now in Russia as well. And I plan on doing them also with Thailand, Vietnam, uh, lots of countries that are kind of within a few hours of travel by plane from Japan. So if you're in Japan you, and you might want to hop over or maybe you have a layover, uh, it might inform you a bit better. Let us go up to the motherland and I will see you, my subscribers who I love deeply with a fervent passion, probably an inappropriate passion for, uh, for this type of person camera relationship so deeply, so, so deeply. All right, bye-bye.